in March of 1933. Europe and the rest of the world would be forever changed when Adolf Hitler became the Reich's Chancellor of Germany. And Hitler and the Nazis had a plan and they knew what they were doing because within just a few weeks of Hitler taking power, construction began on a concentration camp at the site where I am today at Dachau. I wanted to start our visit here at Dachau with one of the more enduring symbols of the Holocaust, railroad tracks. One of the more haunting images that we see come out of the Holocaust are our prisoners being hauled in in freight cars all across uh, Nazi-occupied Europe. Uh, what we are looking at here is one of the few remaining examples of the branch line that connected the main railway station to the camp at Dachau. Uh, the, the rest of it now is kind of like a, a pedestrian path that, that follows the original course. But um, when prisoners would come to Dachau, well, they would come to the main railway station, uh, and then they would either have to walk to the camp. Uh, there was also like vehicular transport or prisoner transport that would take them to the entrance gate. Uh, and then there was also this rail line. Before we move on to the camp, I, I do want to mention something else in connection with these rail lines. In, in late April of 1945, uh, the 45th Infantry Division would have moved into this area. Uh, the 42nd Infantry Division, also the 20th Armored, uh, came into the area of Dachau, and one of the first things that they encountered were these, these rail cars, or these freight cars, that were filled with dead bodies. Well, towards the end of the war, a lot of the camps were being liquidated or, or emptied out, and uh, prisoners were being relocated here to Dachau, and there was something called uh, a death train uh, from Buchenwald that, that came right here to, to this general area. And there's a lot of video footage and photos that you'll see of, of these just awful mounds of corpses stacked up inside these rail cars. And then with the 45th Infantry Division, there were some reprisal killings um, that, that took place in response to what they found when they moved into this area. Um, nobody was ever convicted, uh, and there's been debate ever since over whether it was justified or not. Uh, but, but yeah, there were some, some awful, awful things that took place here at Dachau. All right, we're going to go ahead and, and move on to the main camp now. One thing that people may not realize about Dachau is that this place is more than just the concentration camp. There was a vast compound that housed the SS uh, here in Dachau. Uh, as a matter of fact, this was one of the main training facilities for the SS. So a lot of the camp guards who would go on to other places in the Reich would be trained right here. So you can kind of think of Dachau as the, the model that all of the other camps would be based off of. So if we look here, well, here is the, the main gate going into the camp. Here, the red dot is where we are standing. This right here is all of the SS buildings. So if we look out in this direction, well, behind us is the camp and in front of us is the SS facilities. As a matter of fact, um, the, that building there on the right is where the Commandant's headquarters would have been. And then uh, right here you can see uh, 
the camp itself, which we are getting ready to go through. And then again, all of these different facilities. So there would have been a porcelain factory there. There would have been a clothing factory where um, inmates here at the concentration camp would be making clothing uh, for the SS. And uh, they would enter right along this road and go through that gate. From the rail station, uh, people who had been condemned to come to Dachau would either walk or be transported by truck or rail to this spot right here. And it is through these gates that they would enter into this awful place. Uh, this is called the Jour House. Uh, this is the, the gatehouse and office building of the SS. It was built in uh, 1936. And uh, as people well know, as you entered through that gate, you'd see the words Arbeit macht frei, which means uh, work makes you free or work brings freedom. Um, there would be guards here 24 hours a day. Uh, and there would be a sentry posted on the, the ground floor that would control access uh, into and out of the camp. They would also uh, have an alarm system that was operated from here. And uh, the camp fence, which surrounded the perimeter of the camp, uh, and was electrified um, was powered from here as well. There would also be interrogation rooms inside of this building where the Gestapo would operate. So yeah, kind of a, kind of a dark place here. As we approach the, the gate to go into the camp here, well, on either side they have a few memorials to the divisions who helped to liberate this camp. So this one is to the 20th Armored Division. It says in honor of the 20th Armored Division, Liberators, U.S. 7th Army, who participated in the liberation of Dachau Concentration Camp, April 29th, 1945, and an everlasting memory of the victims of Nazi barbarism. And this tablet was dedicated April 28th, 1996. And then there's another one over here very similar to the 42nd Infantry Division, nicknamed the Rainbow Division. Now, the 45th Infantry Division also participated in the liberation of Dachau, but to my knowledge, they don't have a, a plaque here. And then, uh, yeah, those who entered this camp would have entered through this gate. As you walk through the gates here at Dachau, the first thing that you will come upon is the Oppelplatz, or the, the roll call ground. So uh, every morning and every evening, regardless of the weather conditions, whether it was snowing or raining or whether it was hot sun, uh, there would be a head count. So they would get into rows of 10 all along here. Uh, even the, the dead would have to be dragged out to, to be counted. And the, the guards could do really whatever they wanted here. They could make them stand for a few minutes or they could make them stand for three hours. So you can just uh, imagine the scene here as we we're looking across this open ground, what that must have been like. Throughout Dachau's existence as a concentration camp, there'd be over 200,000 people who would pass through these gates. When we are looking at Dachau, uh, this is of course a concentration camp, but not the type of concentration camp that you may uh, be familiar with. 
Uh, this is not like an Auschwitz. This isn't uh, a death camp. Uh, this was a concentration camp that was set up for political prisoners after Hitler took power in 1933. So up until 1941-42, most of the prisoners that you would have seen assembling here in the Oppelplatz where we are standing uh, would have been Poles or Czech or uh, other German uh, prisoners. And the, the building that we are looking at right now is the maintenance building. So once prisoners entered through those gates right there, well, the, the maintenance building would be the, the first place that they would go to. This was built in 1937 to 38 by the prisoners, so it wasn't here originally. And there would be a kitchen in there, a clothing supply room, baths and uh, workshops. Uh, there was also over here in the West Wing something called a shunting room where um, the, the registration process began for newly arrived prisoners. And on the roof in large letters was painted the, the sentence, there is a path to freedom. Its milestones are obedience, honesty, cleanliness, sobriety, hard work, discipline, sacrifice, truthfulness, and love of thy fatherland. All right, now the, the maintenance building has been converted into a museum. Uh, so we're gonna go in and, and take a moment to see what they have inside. When you come into this building that has been converted into a museum complex, the, the first thing that you see is this vast network of concentration camps. So most people are, you know, familiar with, you know, Auschwitz and Dachau and Buchenwald, but there were camps of various kinds all over Germany and in the occupied areas. Pretty, uh, pretty sobering whenever you see it all laid out on a map like this. This room that we are entering into now is the prisoner transport room. And uh, they have, of course, a bunch of displays here for the museum portion, but a lot of what you see, like the finish on the walls and everything is, is original. So it looks very much like it would have during the, the 30s and 40s. Uh, but this is where prisoners would come in and hand over their belongings and their clothing and things like that. And, uh, you know, here they're, they're standing without all of their belongings. And then they look up to this, which translates to uh, smoking prohibited. So this would have been one of the first rooms that the, uh, the prisoners would have entered into once arriving at Dachau. In this room they have some displays that show artifacts from some of the people who were held here at, uh, at Dachau, uh, including this man whose name was uh, Hermann Bomer. Uh, he was born in 1923 and prior to coming to Dachau, he was uh, in a camp uh, for, uh, it was called a quote, gypsy camp uh, in the Berlin area and uh, was put into uh, police custody and then sent to Sachshausen concentration camp and then um, was eventually transferred here to Dachau. Here's another story of a guy named Joseph Unsen. Um, Joseph Unsen was in the German army and served at the front and then uh, was deployed as a guard to uh, collection camp number six of the armaments detail. And uh, that, that would have been in the Munich area. Well, in November of 44, he helped a friend of his uh, to try and avoid military service by um, injuring himself with a bandage soaked in acid. And when the doctors found out what happened, well, Joseph was not going to find himself in the military anymore. He would be sent to the Dachau concentration camp. Uh, that would have been January of 1945. And uh, he ended up dying here three months later. After the admissions procedure in the room that we were just in, uh, prisoners would have come into this room. Uh, this was the steam distribution room. You can see a, uh, a picture, lighten that up a little bit, of what this would have looked like. 
whenever the concentration camp was in operation. This uh, next room is where the prisoner baths were located. So after going through the, the processes that we just mentioned, uh, this would be the last step of admission. So uh, here prisoners would uh, get a shower, they would be deloused, and, um, and then they would get their uniform that they would wear here at the camp. Uh, also, if you look at these beams up here, uh, I also read that this is a room where the SS would carry out what they called pole hangings. Um, now, prisoners would get a shower about once a week early on, but as things progressed and, and as the war drug on, that became less and less and things became even more unsanitary here. Corporal punishment was something that was a routine thing here at Dachau. And uh, here in this same room, in the shower room, they also carried out some of that corporal punishment, although it was done in other parts of the camp as well. So uh, prisoners would be made to, to lean over this wooden trestle uh, where they would then be beat with uh, bull whips or sticks or, you know, anything else to, to inflict cruelty on these prisoners. And uh, I had also heard that, like, if they passed out in the, the process, well, when they woke back up, they would be forced to start from the beginning and go through the whole thing again. Just absolute cruelty. As I've already mentioned, it's going to be impossible for me to show everything here, but, but I do want to pick out a few things here and there to point out. This is something that I found exceptionally interesting. This is the wedding photo of a guy by the name of Johann Prestel. Uh, so this was taken in 1930. And uh, Prestel ended up becoming a political prisoner here at Dachau. Now take a look at this. Uh, he was a, a stove fitter, and what we are looking at here is an oven tile from an oven that was built by Johann Preschler. And uh, there, there were three German inmates that kind of documented their stay here or what they did uh, on this tile. Now, the text of the inscription says, oven built by Johann Preschler. Uh, now, the text of the inscription here says, oven built by political Dachau prisoner Johann Prestel, stove fitter. Uh, and then it goes on to give some biographical information like, you know, uh, when he was here. And then it says, how much longer the devil only knows. Uh, and then it's signed uh, by the, the prisoners that were assisting him. And um, they hid this tile in an oven and it wasn't discovered until 1980 during demolition work. When we entered the campgrounds, we walked through a gate that said uh, Arbeit macht frei, which means work will set you free. And uh, that gate is actually a replica. What we are looking at here is the original gate that was built by the camp prisoners in uh, 1936. Uh, now, in... Um, 2014, there were some people that forcibly entered the grounds of the memorial site and stole this gate, which is an unbelievable dirtbag move. I can't even imagine somebody doing that kind of a thing, but they did. Um, and of course, the, the replica went up where the historical camp gate was located. Um, but then in 2016, an anonymous tip led police to a Norwegian city uh, in Bergen that led to the recovery of the, the stolen gate. Uh, that was in February of 2017, uh, that it was returned here. But yeah, this is the original gate.
we've just exited out of the maintenance building and here on the site they don't have any of the original barracks but they do have some reconstructed barracks that we're going to take a look at here in just a moment uh, but first I, I want to show the perimeter defenses that were designed to keep people inside of the gates of Dachau again from 1937 to 1938 a, a new camp was built here in Dachau and the perimeter fence that they built here made escape nearly impossible. So for one, there were seven guard towers along the perimeter of the camp um, and they kept constant watch over this area. Now, let's say for the sake of argument, you were a prisoner inside this camp and you wanted to try and escape. Well, first, you would have to enter across this, what is now a, a green lawn. Uh, this was the prohibited zone. If you entered into this area, you were subject to being shot. If you manage to get past the prohibited zone, well then, there was this ditch that completely went along the outside of the camp. If you made it through the ditch, well then, there are tangles of barbed wire. Beyond the barbed wire, you have to deal with electric fencing. And then there is another perimeter that is constantly being patrolled by guards. And then finally, this concrete fence, which again has barbed wire at the top. So once you were in here, getting out was nearly impossible. Obviously, it goes without saying that the, the suffering here in Dachau is uh, something that, that most of us just can't comprehend. And for some people in here, the, the suffering just proved to be too much. And one of the ways that prisoners would just uh, put an end to that suffering was to run towards these perimeter fences where they would either be shot or they would throw themselves up against the electric fence. And, um, and kill themselves in, in that manner. Just, just awful to think people uh, of people being in that desperate and terrible of a situation where they would be um, put in a position to, to do that. All right, we're gonna go take a look at uh, the reconstructed barracks now. Here inside the residential barracks, you can see uh, what these bunks and what this area would have looked like, except for this is rather clean. Uh, it wouldn't have been nearly as clean during the time that Dachau was in operation. And uh, these residential barracks were designed to hold 200 people. In reality, they ended up holding about 2,000. So it would be very easy for us to look at one of these sections and think, oh, okay, there's one bed section for one person. Um, but in reality, you would have had multiple people stacked up in here together, uh, laying on beds of straw. Of course, people sick from typhus and all kinds of other ailments. Um, typhus is actually spread by lice. The way that lice got into the camp was they were running out of clothing here. So uh, they imported some clothing that was, um, oh, I guess taken from, from people in uh, Auschwitz. And uh, lice ended up getting into the population here and then spreading typhus. But uh, yeah, this would have been a miserable, miserable place. What we are looking at right here in this reconstructed barracks is the washroom. Now of a morning before roll call, Everybody in this entire barrack would be required to uh, wash up, but would only have a few minutes. So you can imagine several hundred people trying to crowd in here and, and make use of the, the washroom and also of the toilet facilities in here. So there, there was a certain uh, cruelty 
that was exacted on these people uh, by the SS where they like watched them scramble to try and use these facilities and get out to roll call on time. While we are here talking about the barracks, I want to mention blocks one, three, and five, which is just beyond block three here. There were unimaginably cruel medical experiments that were conducted on the prisoners here at Dachau. And those medical experiments took place in these three blocks. Uh, so some of the human experimentation that, that was done here uh, were medical experiments uh, with malaria, uh, also testing to see uh, the, the effects of altitude uh, on the human body. They had pressure chambers that they would put people in. Uh, they were also testing the, the limits, they were testing the limits of hypothermia on the human body. Uh, just subjecting these poor people to uh, a, a level of cruelty that, that seems incomprehensible to, to us today. Um, the, the infirmary here at Dachau was actually well equipped, but the medical care goes without saying was completely awful and uh, there, there was a lot of sickness uh, here in these barracks typhus um, just absolutely awful uh, so so prisoners who became ill uh, well if they could not be brought back to health quickly well they would go to the infirmary where uh, they would die shortly after So I just learned something new uh, about Dachau, or at least new to me. Uh, this is something that I had never heard before. If you look at this building, well, that building would have stood right here. Now originally there was a, a garden here in the camp, uh, and then uh, they had animals here. They would use the wool for Luftwaffe uniforms, and in 1941 a disinfection facility for the prisoners' clothing was built here. But in the spring of 1944, the SS set up a so-called special barrack. And uh, this is just suffering on top of suffering. This was a, a bordello uh, where female prisoners from Ravensbrück were forced into prostitution. I've made my way to the other end of the camp and here on this end of Dachau, they have some faith-based memorials. So uh, over here to our left, this is a chapel uh, for the, the Christians. In the center is the, the Catholic memorial, and to our right is the Jewish memorial. Right now, the Jewish memorial appears to be undergoing some, some renovation or some improvements. So unfortunately, I can't go down there and show what I would like to show. But, but I do think that what they have done here is worth mentioning and worth talking about. If you look at how they have built this, as you go down to the memorial, you are descending down this dark path. And when you enter into the memorial, you are entering into this, this cavernous darkness. But in the middle of that darkness, there's a white band of marble that goes all the way to an opening in the ceiling where you can see that menorah at the top that is allow, allows a beam of light to shine down. Symbolizing that even in the darkest place, a place like Dachau, there's still hope and there's still light. So for many here at Dachau, whether they were Christian or Catholic or Jewish, uh, it was their faith that brought them through this, this dark time and this unimaginable suffering. 
So again, this is the, the Catholic monument here at Dachau. And uh, the name of it is uh, the Catholic Mortal Agony of Christ Chapel. Uh, this was dedicated in 1960 at the initiative of a bishop named uh, Johann Neuhausler. Uh, he was a prisoner here at Dachau. Okay, so this is a man who who experienced the suffering and, and experienced the, the darkness of this place. And the reason that the name Mortal Agony of Christ was chosen was uh, as an allusion to the, the mortal agony under which tens of thousands of inmates suffered uh, day and night for years here in the camp. And then you see the, the crown of thorns at the top. So basically likening the, the mortal agony of Christ with the agony of the people who suffered here and, and showing that, that Christ is not uh, detached or, or distant or unfamiliar with, with our suffering. Here is a closer look at the Protestant Memorial here at Dachau. Um, the official name is the Protestant Church of Reconciliation. And you can see the, like the, the lines and the edges of this church are a little bit different. They're kind of asymmetrical. And that is to contrast with the symmetrical design of this camp. And I think it's interesting that they chose the name Church of Reconciliation. I would imagine that the people who survived this experience had, had seen enough death and, and hatred and were ready for something different when they left. And uh, to, to hate is honestly pretty easy for us to do, but to, to forgive and to reconcile uh, is vastly more powerful. And this church reflects that. As I've mentioned a few times already, uh, Dachau was not a, a death camp. This was a, a work camp. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't a lot of death within these walls. As a matter of fact, about 20% of the, the people who entered through the gates of Dachau would never leave. There was malnutrition. Uh, there, there was disease. Prisoners were, were worked to death. And uh, we're getting ready to, to leave the, the camp complex itself and go to the part of Dachau that I consider to be probably the, the most sobering spot in this place. In the summer of 1940, foreign prisoners started arriving here at Dachau, and with that, the number of deaths here really began to ramp up. So the SS found it necessary to build a crematorium uh, just outside of the, the camp walls in order to dispose of the remains of all of the dead. So this crematorium was built in the summer of 1940 and would be in operation until April of 1943 when an even larger facility became necessary. But while this crematorium was in operation, there were approximately 11,000 prisoners who were cremated in this very oven. Hmm. When the original crematorium proved to be insufficient to um, accommodate the number of dead here at Dachau, well, this facility was built. This was built between 1942 and 1943. Um, and here on the left-hand side was a disinfectant center. Uh, here in the middle is where we would find the 
uh, gas chamber. So this was going to be used as a killing center, uh, although it never was put into full effect. Um, there, there was some killings that took place in here, but, but mass killings on a large scale did not happen at, at this gas chamber. It's not to say that it didn't happen at others, but it, it just didn't happen here. And then over here on the right hand side, uh, this is where the, the larger crematorium was going to be built. I'm standing on the left hand side of the building that I was just showing uh, where the disinfectant of clothing would take place. So clothing would be brought into these chambers right here. You would uh, have Zyklon B that would be added to the chamber uh, to kill any lice or uh, any bugs or mites that might be in the clothing. Uh, and then there was a, a ventilator that would would pump the air out before they came in here and, and got the clothing. And uh, I heard one account of uh, clothing coming in from Auschwitz because the clothing was not being used there anymore because that was a mass killing center. We're going to go ahead and enter into Barrack X here. and. Uh, just do a, a quick walk through. So this room that we are standing in right now is the waiting room. Uh, this is where victims would be informed that uh, that they were going to be entering into a shower. And then in this room is where they would be asked to disrobe. So you can see Brass bed right there. Uh, that means shower. And from there they would enter into the gas chamber. This room right here is the gas chamber. Now again it was never used for its intended purpose but uh, we can get an idea of, of what would have happened in here if things would have continued if the war hadn't have ended. So this could hold uh, about 150 people and um, they would be in here for about 15 to 20 minutes. The Zyklon B would be put into this room through these ports right here and then again they would wait about 15 to 20 minutes and after all the people in here had uh, suffocated well then they would uh, pump the air out. There was a, a water supply that was provided in here where they could clean up and then the bodies would be moved into this room right here. So this is called the, the death chamber and uh, this is where the bodies would be held until uh, cremation. All right, and then moving into this room, this was the crematorium that was built in, uh, in 1943 to basically accommodate for the, the growing number of dead here in the camp. Boy, just a sobering thought.
when the men of the 45th and 42nd Infantry Divisions and 20th Armored Division arrived here at Dachau. Now you can just imagine being an 18, 19, 20 year old guy and walking up on this scene. Uh, right here in, in front of us there would have been just piles and piles of bodies. And you might ask yourself, if there was a, a crematorium in operation, why were there so many bodies that were stacked up outside of this building? Well, the answer is, in February of 1945, there was a coal shortage in Germany, and uh, they didn't have enough coal to operate the crematorium. So they ended up just stacking bodies here until they could be buried in a mass grave. But, yeah, awful. I've now moved just uh, away from the, the gas chamber and crematorium. And as I mentioned, just because the, the gas chambers weren't put into full effect here at Dachau uh, doesn't mean that there weren't some awful things that took place here and executions that, that were, were carried out. Matter of fact, right here along this wall, prisoners were, were brought here and lined up and, and executed. And there's what they call a, uh, a blood ditch. Uh, along here that would allow for the, the drainage of blood. It, it, just unbelievable, uh, some of the awful things that, that people are, are capable of. But of all the places I've been, this one might have the, the heaviest and, and most somber feel to it. Uh, we have some other places here in this area that we're going to go take a look at that tie in with the history of Dachau, uh, but that'll be in the next video.